Hi, my name is Mark Orthodoxy, VP of Strategic Marketing for the Interconnect SOC Business Unit here at Rambus. Today, I'm here to talk to you about how Rambus and CXL will transform the data center. So I'm hoping you take away three messages from this discussion today. The first one, of course, being that CXL is a disruption unlike any we've seen in many years in the data center, and it will introduce new architectures. The second is that this isn't gonna happen all at once. In fact, CXL technology will be adopted in phases. First, we're likely to see solutions that address the need for memory expansion to feed the ever-increasing growing compute core counts. The second will largely be addressing memory inefficiency or memory utilization inefficiency in the data center by reducing memory stranding. So solutions like memory pooling are likely to be introduced. In addition, in that time frame, we may need we may see some innovative solutions for near memory compute. And then finally, we will look to address the utopia of rack scale disaggregation, which includes not only compute, I.O. and storage, but also memory. And finally, I hope you take away that Rambus is uniquely positioned in this ecosystem to deliver, to deliver innovative solutions. So who is Rambus? Well, Rambus is founded on a strong history of semiconductor solutions and innovation. Our foundation is a set of IP and patents that is the basis for much of the technology that we create. We have a thriving silicon IP business in the form of interface IP and security IP. Our interface IP includes CXL and PCIe controllers that are quite pervasive in the industry, uh, CERTES, as well as FIs and controllers for memory. We also have a great deal of security IP, including root of trust and encryption engine solutions. And finally, we have a thriving semiconductor business, which is largely focused on memory system solutions. So immediately you can see that Rambus is well poised to deal with solutions in the memory space. The domains in which we service are largely both compute and memory servicing a large number of end markets, but the majority of our revenue from silicon IP and chips comes from the data center. So before we talk about the architectures that will be enabled by CXL, it is important to discuss what's happening fundamentally in the data center that's driving the need for some of those solutions. And I think the most important thing here is that memory systems are becoming a critical bottleneck in the data center. There is a relentless demand for more memory bandwidth as well as more memory capacity. If you look at the chart on the bottom left, it talks to how increasing core counts are driving the need for more memory bandwidth. This is a slide that was presented by Meta back in OCP Summit 2021. And it shows the gap that's growing between core count and the memory bandwidth that's available per core. The second notable thing is on the capacity front, just how large some of these data sets are getting, especially in the areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning. If you look at the chart on the bottom right, it's one that was uh, done by Intel. It shows how year over year, the size of these data sets is growing 10x. And in fact, last year with the Wudao model, the one teraparameter model size actually was surpassed and they showed a model that was almost two teraparameters large. So who knows how, that's gonna, how big that's gonna get in the future. So when we look then at the data center memory challenges, we've talked about bandwidth per core decreasing and the need to free up more bandwidth. Um, we've also talked about the need for more capacity. So if you add more capacity to a server, what are your options today in terms of storing a data set? Well, you can of course add more servers, which comes with compute and memory. So you run the risk of using the compute much less efficiently than you could otherwise, or you can move some of that data set onto slower primary storage. And so what that creates though, is a bit of a latency gap in terms of the options you have at your disposal to grow the memory system. Um, so that's a huge challenge as we look forward. How do we get more data accessible with low latency to the compute? The, the third challenge, which is new, I haven't talked about that yet, is this notion of memory stranding. And really what we mean by this is, um, if you're a data center architect, one of your jobs is to dial in the provisioning for any given server to deal with peak workload. So you have to dial in how much memory you want to put inside that server. Now, no matter how good of a job is done, the reality is that you're going to find scenarios where the peak workloads that you're trying to prepare for are just not at that moment in time 
running on the server. And so you end up with this memory that is sitting dormant, not being utilized, which is a very expensive resource. So one of the challenges the data centers face is how do we go and collectively on a grand scale, use that memory more efficiently? CXL attempts to address all three of these issues, and we'll talk about how. So let's go back to the latency gap. Um, CXL is really the solution that the ecosystem is broadly accepting as the vehicle to introduce memory tiering into the data center. This is not unlike what happened in storage um, in decades past, right? The introduction of uh, hard disks after tape drives and then flash after that. So what we see in this diagram here is at least three new tiers being added in the, in the uh, data storage latency pyramid. The first one being CXL direct attached DRAM. So here we would see a latency impact over native attached DRAM, but the goal is to keep that latency as small as possible. So it's least impactful and noticeable to the software. It's generally accepted that about a NUMA hop worth of latency is absorbable by most workloads in the system. And uh, that's really the design target for many of the initial CXL memory solutions. When you go to pooling and then to larger fabrics, which we'll talk about as we go through the presentation a little bit more, obviously you're creating larger memory pools, you're making them accessible to more hosts, you're putting them physically further away from the compute potentially. This adds more latency. So as you go to larger pools of memory or resources and put them further away, the latency does start to get larger. However, it still is orders of magnitude less than storage as we would see it today. The last thing I'll say on this slide is the software ecosystem to support this type of infrastructure also needs to be in place to take advantage of it. And we are seeing great strides being made both by commercial software vendors as well as the open source community. So it seems as though we are getting well prepared for the availability of this type of CXL technology to go and address some of these memory challenges. Okay, so what is the CXL enabled server? What does it look like? Well, this slide sort of compares the two. On the left-hand side, you have a traditional server. It shows how a smart NIC might exist as well as an optional GPU or AI accelerator attached to a single CPU. So maybe it's a single socket server. And of course that CPU has native DRAM attached to it in the form of DDR4 or DDR5 would be the modern example. Um, channels, which are very wide parallel interfaces that consume a lot of pins on the package. Um, now, in a you know, hypothetical configuration, you can see an example of some math at the bottom, uh, 1.5 terabytes, if you were willing to spend the money on that kind of memory capacity, could be supported in a solution like this. Now, on the right-hand side, you see a CXL-enabled server. Now, this talk is not a CXL tutorial, so I won't spend too much time talking about what is CXL as a protocol and as a standard, other than to say that you know, CXL is an open standard, of course, for load store transactions uh, with very low latency, and there's some options for coherency, and it introduces three different device types, type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 1 and type 2 are essentially out of scope for this discussion. Um, they deal mostly with uh, access to coherent cache from the CPU. Uh, what we're going to talk about are largely type 3 devices. Now, type 3 devices on the right-hand side of that diagram on the right uh, are shown there. Often, these will take the form of a CXL memory module, is what we typically call them. And you can see the CXL interfaces coming off, in this case, both the CPU and the AI accelerator connecting up to those things. Now, the diagram on the left, going back to that for a second, showed PCIe connecting up components. The diagram on the right replaces that with these blue CXL links. That talks to the fact that CXL runs over PCIe electricals. This is a huge benefit for CXL because essentially it does not require the sheer plumbing of the server to be rebuilt or re-architected. Rather, as long as the devices on both ends of the plumbing support CXL as a protocol, you can actually use existing infrastructure. So by adding CXL memory modules into existing infrastructure on the server, we've actually increased the memory capacity and the memory bandwidth in the system. So for example, if you were to throw say four CXL memory modules into the system attached into the CPU, 
you can easily do the math to show that you've delivered 2x the memory capacity and as much as 50% more memory bandwidth to those cores running in the CPU. But there's other benefits to CXL attached memory that are beyond just bandwidth and capacity. Um, for example, now we have new vehicles for customers to do custom memory solutions, where before their options were simply plug more or less RDIMs of different capacities into, this, into the CPU or into the server. Now we can actually tune bandwidth per unit of capacity, making compromises in terms of error correction and other kind of RAS capabilities. We also have this notion of media independence. Very important principle with serial attached memory like CXL attached memory is that the media controller, the DRAM controller has moved off the CPU into an SOC that lives on an external module. What this means is that now memory types that are not natively supported by the CPU can be supported. So for example, imagine running DDR4 on a CPU that otherwise only natively talks DDR5. Amazing opportunities for reuse and cost savings in large scale data center deployments. Um, the fourth item on this slide talks to persistent memory. We haven't talked about persistent memory yet. This actually is also a great vehicle for persistent memory to increase its pervasive footprint in the data center. The challenges historically with persistent memory have been you need to downgrade the performance on a high performing DDR interface on the CPU. You may have to make changes to the BIOS to make it all work. Only some CPUs natively support the protocol that's actually required to use specific persistent memory. So this actually gives a standard interface with no real system configuration changes required to take advantage of new media types, including persistent memory or storage class memory. And then finally, lower solution costs. So if you imagine um, a serial interface connecting up to a memory module is much more pen efficient than a parallel DDR interface. So what that means is more memory bandwidth is available to a CPU with less pins that will reduce package costs, it will reduce die costs over time and really enable a new level of memory uh, bandwidth per compute core on existing die footprints. Okay, so we talked a lot about direct attached CXL memory for the various benefits that that provides. Now let's talk about some of the scaling of CXL. Now, as soon as you serialize the interface to the memory, you've actually opened up all kinds of possibilities in terms of moving that memory further from the compute engines if the latency is tolerable. And there's kind of two different solutions for this that are broadly accepted as options to enable that type of memory pooling. Uh, the first is often called, not to overuse the term, CXL memory pooling, which is essentially you have a memory node or a memory appliance with one or more CXL pooling memory controllers. And this memory node is directly connected to a bunch of compute nodes. Um, it also has embedded on it the media controllers required to drive, for example, DRAM. So you have this memory appliance, which will direct connect to a number of hosts or compute engines, and it will have a bunch of memory directly populated in it. Now, the advantage of this is it's the lowest latency solution to build a pool of memory. So as you can imagine, if we go to a larger scale system, you have more links and more hops and more devices to pass through that will add latency. Of course, the drawbacks with memory pooling are it doesn't scale quite as as large as a fabric will, as we'll talk about in a second. And it also, of course, uh, limits you with the flexibility on how much different kinds of media you can put in the memory node because the media controller is embedded in that memory node, in that pooling memory controller. And so you are you know, restricted to what that memory pooling controller can support. Now on the right is a switch or a fabric attached memory architecture. This actually introduces the scale that maybe we were missing in the memory pooling solution to the left of it. It also is not strictly speaking a memory pooling solution alone because it allows for the heterogeneous connectivity of any type three device, any type two device. So GPUs, it can put, you can put PCIe devices on this infrastructure if you wanted to, um, like storage devices, NICs, et cetera. Now, of course, the drawback with this beyond, you know, a, a level up in complexity is the latency penalty because you're taking more hops, you have larger devices and passing through more of them. So that's the, the compromise you make here. And the industry broadly is 
studying latency tolerances, and that will be, you know, a, a reality for the next couple of years still before we see this deployed broadly. Now, memory pooling sounds cool, but is there any real data to support it solving a problem? And I think one really uh, good paper that effectively captures not just the problem, but also CXL as a solution is one that recently was published by Microsoft with Carnegie Mellon. It's in the public domain. There's a link for it, a link to it here in the slide. Um, some of the things that it, it, it mentions, and I just have a summary of some of the takeaways here. Um, first of all, half the cost of a server is memory. That's an astounding, that's an astounding number. 25% of the memory is stranded in the data center. Again, an astoundingly large number. Beyond that, 50% of the virtual machines in Azure, as the paper says, never touch 50% of their rented memory. I mean, imagine that. Not only is the memory that you're that you that you that you've rented being underutilized or using being underutilized, you're not actually even touching 50% of it. Disaggregation, it concludes, is needed to reduce memory stranding. And CXL has the low overhead required to implement that. The last thing that I think is really notable in the paper is eight of 13 Azure workloads were cited as being tolerant to the moderate um, latency hits that CXL introduces. And the rest of them suffered a slight performance degradation, but again, it was a very minor performance degradation. So Microsoft's presented a pretty compelling case here. And I think that is very powerful in support of this type of architecture and the problems that it's solving. The last thing I'll say on use cases is I made mention earlier on of near memory compute. What is that? Well, near memory compute is really the notion that you take some compute cores and you actually put it on the CXL memory module. And this has a number of benefits. It's mostly around efficiency. So if you can imagine you're using compute resources more efficiently, you're using memory resources more efficiently, and you're reducing data movement, which really reduces power. Um, the application where this is most likely going to find relevance, again, is in AI or machine learning. So we can essentially do a small amount of vector processing directly on the module to accelerate those workloads. Now, the question I'm sure you're asking is, well, okay, these CXL memory modules sound very esoteric. What is What do they look like? Well, they will be all shapes and colors, but there's two broad categories, I would say, that are likely to emerge. The first one is the EDSFF style memory module, which is in a form factor that frankly was invented for flash storage and looks to be very well suited for things like building DRAM CXL memory, memory modules. So this is a form factor that's well understood. A lot of PCIe Gen 5 servers, most in fact, will have front of server slots that are compliant that will allow for this. In the 2U server case, E3.S is most commonly seen. Um, E3.S is, <clears throat> again, well suited for uh, CXL memory modules, and we're likely to see 1T and 2T examples of that. Uh, the 1T and 2T uh, represent the thickness of the module. So that'll be very popular and the advantages, it takes advantage of the uh, existing infrastructure and plugs right in. Um, the other category though is CXL add-in cards or custom cards. And here um, they're likely gonna take the form for the most part of PCIe SIG chem style add-in cards. The difference with these are for the most part, these will have dim connectors on the board because the form factor better allows for this deployment model versus an EDSFF drive. And RDIMs, standard RDIMs that you would buy today and plug into the server will plug into those cards, allowing for memory expansion um, via CXL without actually having to build new memory products other than the carrier board. The advantages of this are twofold. One is um, it's much easier to draw larger numbers of lanes of CXL from a CPU to a single board like this if you actually plug it into the back of the server instead of the front of the server where the drives are, because the back plane for storage is not really necessarily well suited to draw quite so many lanes to a single module. So if you have, uh, say, 16 lanes of CXL that you want to draw to a card, this might be a better solution to deliver yet more bandwidth than you can offer in an EDSFF module, practically speaking. The other benefit is that the DIMM slots uh, allow you for standard RDIMs, which means that you're not locked into a memory supplier. If you want to use memory supplier A or memory supplier B or transition from one to the other over time, it gives you that flexibility. So 
why CXL? Why not some other standard? Well, I mean, at this point, it's fair to say that CXL is going to be ubiquitously adopted by the ecosystem. It has the support from, you know, virtually every major OEM, um, memory supplier, hyperscaler, semiconductor company, software company, IP company. It's really sort of the next generation interconnect standard for load store, low latency memory. Um, if you look at what CXL has evolved to become, it's actually evolved now to a point where virtually all the solutions that I've outlined so far can be realized. Um, the CXL consortium just released CXL 3.0. Please check out rambus.com for additional training videos on CXL 3.0. This is the latest release of a quite rich specification. Um, CXL 1.1 introduced enough capability to uh, really allow for effective, what I'll call prototyping. CXL 2.0 is largely recognized as the deployment phase for CXL, and it introduces capability that's beyond just basic attachment, including pooling, basic switching, the security elements that are necessary in such infrastructure and capabilities that allow better for persistent memory support. With CXL3, though, this is what I term the scaling phase. So this is when we allow for PCIe Gen 6 electricals to be taken advantage of, so 64 gigatransfers per second. Fabric switching, not just basic single-level switching, can be in introduced. And there's also concepts for coherent memory sharing, which is a concept that is we'll save for a future talk. But you know, with CXL3, we've really gotten to the scaling phase and we're gonna see exciting solutions come to market as a result. Which begs the question, what's the timeline for all this stuff? Well, obviously I can't speak to the roadmaps of others, and uh, but broadly speaking, you can assume, I think at this point, that we're gonna see a lot of sample products come available in the market in 2023. Um, and, and I think generally most folks agree that CXL memory modules and add-in cards for the direct attached use case will have their ramp year in 2024. And then that will follow with memory appliances that include memory pooling appliances, and that will follow yet again with rack level solutions. The other thing that's interesting to note as you keep on top of what's happening in the CXL ecosystem and how folks are differentiated. I think, you know, these are the things to look for, right? There's a lot of different ways that um, companies introducing solutions in this space can differentiate. One is in, in sheer bandwidth, right? Uh, questions like how well is my bandwidth to the host matched with my bandwidth to the media for a CXL memory module, for example. The second, of course, is latency. Latency is king in this domain and lowest latency is the best. Scalability. What are the densities that I can support on a device? How high radix is my memory pooling solution or my switch? And have I addressed the quality of service requirement to deliver that scalability effectively? Security. Obviously, as soon as you start doing things in particular, like sharing memory or pooling memory, then confidential compute is extremely important. Power efficiency. Obviously, power is also one of the key metrics in a data center from a, you know, a, a total operating cost standpoint. And so if you can deliver power, if, if you can deliver a solution with effective power or efficient power, that's a good thing. But also, Folks want to spend as much of the power on memory as possible. So you want the components that are enabling all this connectivity to run with the lowest possible power. And then reliability. As soon as you start to talk about memory pools um, or even just moving the memory a little bit further away from the compute, then all of a sudden you need to worry about blast radius and also error correction. Error correction is an important differentiation for a lot of companies because historically ECC lived inside the CPU. Um, as part of the media controller. Now that media controller is going off uh, system and third parties, likely new companies that weren't before implementing such things need to worry about it. And so we'll be seeing all kinds of interesting innovation in the area of error detection and correction. Okay, so what is Rambus doing in this space and how are we differentiated? Um, first of all, the company, as I mentioned earlier, is literally founded on the notion of solving the memory wall problem, getting more memory to the compute. 
We have years and years of innovation. We've done everything from near memory compute to innovation on high bandwidth new memory interfaces. In fact, we have cores that deliver some of the highest bandwidth memory interfaces on earth. And we're a leader in delivering silicon solutions in memory technology. For example, we were the first supplier of an RCD, a DDR5, that taught 5,600 megatransfers. So obviously, the DNA of the company is well suited to this segment. We announced last year the CXL Memory Interconnect Initiative. Um, this talked to a lot of the things that I talked about today, and it really gave a sense or a hint of what's to come. And we've been investing to execute against that initiative. So Rambus fundamentally is built on memory and CERDES technology, security technology, and advanced compute architectures. Um, we then last year acquired PLDA. PLDA has a pervasive set of IP for CXL and PCIe controllers. Uh, we announced the acquisition of Analog X, which greatly enhanced our high-speed I.O. offering. And then most recently, we announced the acquisition of Hardent. And Hardent is an advanced SOC design center with a very strong capability in ECC. And as I mentioned, that's a very important differentiator for solutions in this space. So Rambus is investing on top of a strong foundation to really lead in this space from a technology standpoint, as well as a design capability standpoint. And that really is illustrated quite effectively on this slide. And while I won't talk to every bullet on this slide, the main points on it I think you should take away are, we have a ton of industry leading IP. We have a great history of innovation in memory and we understand memory subsystems um, as, as very few do. And we have a very strong SOC design capability to wrap all those pieces up in compelling solutions. So, I hope that this was a informative talk for you today. Um, just to reiterate the three messages that I was hoping I could pass on to you today. CXL is gonna disrupt the data center uh, more so than we've seen in recent decades. CXL3 recently announced by the CXL consortium delivers the scalability to introduce new compelling solutions. And Rambus is uniquely positioned to deliver solutions in this space. I wanna thank you for your time today and I hope you have a great day.